Uh, this is uh, the fourth time I've introduced someone this year, um, but uh, this is the one I'm probably most excited about because it blends together two of my favorite things. Uh, so uh, Fima is going to be talking to us today. He uh, went to US, uh, USC for undergrad and then went to Mayo Clinic for uh, both an MD and a master's. Uh, and then he went to Cornell for his internship and residency. He joined us for his fellowship in cardiology, but he was a hospitalist for a few years in the meantime. Uh, and the most exciting part of his life, he's about to embark on for the next two years as one of our EP fellows. Um, and uh, he has, he's done some interesting things when you go through. I'll just say the, the two uh, current things that he's doing that um, I'm excited about is he's both the fellow and training uh, co-chair for the ACC's Washington chapter. And I've also been able to work with him uh, separately on, uh, as he's the co-chair of the resident and fellow uh, IT committee here for UW. So he is going to talk about a subject that I find fascinating, which is the conduction system in general, but especially in athletes. Um, so uh, go ahead, FEMA. Thank you so much, Jordan, for that introduction. And thank you so much, everyone, for attending Grand Rounds today. I think we have a little bit of something for everyone in this talk, from the generalist who's going to see former athletes as patients, to the structuralist, scientist, imagers, and of course, electrophysiologist in each of our hearts. Uh, speaking of hearts, I don't have any relevant conflicts of interest or disclosures. I do have two personal ones, though. You may recognize the heart on the left is from Selling Sunset. My wife and I enjoy that show a lot. Uh, my wife has been the major reason I've gotten into exercising and feel as good as I do. Um, the picture on the right is from a chat thread of people in the UW Cardiac Peloton Squad. And you can see Elizabeth Bailey, uh, our uh, congenital heart disease nurse practitioner, texting that she is grateful to the UW Cardiac Squad. And I, too, am grateful since it motivated me uh, during my first year of fellowship here. So this is my agenda for today. Um, we're going to um, cover some background and discovery of the cardiac conduction system. Um, my three objectives are for you to understand normal cardiac conduction through the sinoatrial node, AV node, and atrial myocardium. Um, <clears throat> secondly, I'm, I want you to understand the effects of athletic training on cardiac conduction with the focus on electrical and structural remodeling. And I want you to understand and manage bradycardia and AFib in veteran athletes. I'll have a little bit of time at the end for future research and therapeutic directions. I wanna note that you could have a whole other grand rounds on ventricular arrhythmias and exercise. So we're gonna mostly remain above the bundle for this talk. Uh, this talk was inspired by Jordan who suggested we write a review on new findings about the sinoatrial and atrioventricular node. And we're gonna discuss those today. Athletic training is increasingly popular in this country, um, whether you have a peloton or you just enjoy the SNL peloton to sketch. Um, intense exercise plays a large role in your lives or uh, the lives of many of your patients. Um, this clip from the New York Times in 2021 says that more than 600,000 people ran an ultra marathon in 2018, and that number is rapidly rising. From a CNBC post in 2016, we see that there were 4 million CrossFit uh, devotees um, in that year. So not all of them will go on to become elite athletes but many will um, change their heart in ways um, that they would need to see you. Um, so I want to highlight uh, some of the history here. And first, there's Mark Silverman, who wrote several reviews on this topic. Um, he died in 2008. We'll start with the Egyptians, who knew from the Ebers papyrus, um, named after an American farmer, George Ebers, who purchased these ancient treasures in Luxor in the 1800s. They were dated to 1500 BC. The Egyptians were keen anatomists and understood the importance of the plumbing and beating of the heart. In 1839, Gian Evangelista Perkinji discovered gelatinous fibers in cheap ventricular subendocardium. I wasn't able to find those specimens, but I was able to find his representation of the sympathetic chain ganglia pictured on the right. These writings on the left are from a lecture he gave in 1845, uh, around when he founded the first Department of Physiology in Prague. Walter Gaskell in the 1880s uh, found that different parts of the heart had their own intrinsic beating rates. Shown here on the bottom are drawings from his work in which he ligated the atrium ventricles to show that they could beat independently of each other, a condition that one of his collaborators began to call complete block. You can see him pictured here with a reptile as he was keen to use those for his specimens. Um, Wilhelm Hiss Jr. in 1893, by examining serial embryologic sections, he showed that connective tissue sheet became a bundle connecting the upper and lower cardiac chambers, which he called the bundle of Hiss. The left panel is a reproduction of the drawing provided by his showing the location of the penetrating AV bundle with the asterisk right here um, in a four-chamber mouse section. 
The next physician, Dr. Sunao Tawara, was greatly affected by world events at the time, as Japanese society had just opened up to the West. Dr. Tawara traveled to Marburg, Germany, where he worked with Ludwig Ashoff. Sunao Tawara traced the bundle of his backward to find a compact node of fibers at the base of the atrial septum and forward where it connected with the bundles, uh, the, with the bundle of cells discovered by Purkinje. Tawara used the word notum, meaning not, and we now use the word node. These are drawings from his original work, the left ventricle on top with the conduction system and the right ventricle on bottom showing the beautiful tree-like arborization of the his Purkinje fiber network. Arthur Keith and his student Martin Flack studied the conduction system of a mole and found a structure in the sinoauricular junction that histologically resembled the AV node. They felt that this was where the dominating rhythm of the heart begins and named it the sinoauricular node in 1907. You can see from their drawings at that time, um, right here. Um, lastly, uh, I should say you should um, read about Arthur Keith. He it was a great um, a scientist and anthropologist, but had other views that were abhorrent. So I think um, it's important to know that history. Um, um, finally, Thomas Lewis is pictured on the right. He would not be pictured here if not for Wilhelm Eindhoven, who's pictured on the left, who transcribed electrical signal onto paper using a polygraph-like device shown here. Lewis used his ECG tracing attached to leads in the heart that demonstrated that the sinoatrial node was the origin of the electrical pulse. And you can see those tracings on the bottom and the tall panel. Uh, it wasn't yet possible for them to actually get the sinoatrial node signal, as we'll learn, but this is local atrial signal and nonetheless a monumental discovery. He looks like a rather jolly character here on the right. Uh, understanding anatomy is critical to computational modeling and creating highly representative, aka digital twin style simulations. This graphic shows you six key elements of a highly representative model, including geometry, fiber orientation, the cardiac conduction system, pathology like fibrosis, layers, and finally, application of the model under certain conditions like pacing. I'm going to show you a couple examples of sim simulations. On the left is a model of a heart of a patient with tetralogy of Fallot, showing both ventricles, uh, the right ventricle and left ventricle. <clears throat> Um, and this type of pacing simulation can be used to identify a slow isthmus that can lead to reentrant ventricular tachycardia, shown here. On the right is, is an example of a left atrium with the posterior wall facing us on the left image and the anterior wall on the right image. And you can see pacing on the left inferior pulmonary vein. Um, and uh, what happens after this pacing is that uh, rotor is induced right here. And we think these are some of the mechanisms that perpetuate atrial fibrillation. These simulations were produced by the work of Dr. Patrick Boyle. Uh, my mentor, is, as well as my EP mentor, Nazma Kum, and their outstanding graduate student, Savannah Bifulco. Um, more recently, it has become possible to use contrast enhanced micro CT to image the cardiac conduction system at the near cellular level to better understand the distribution and even orientation of the cardiac conduction system in the intact heart. Here, samples were bathed in potassium iodide for several days, and then CT was performed using 73 micrometer slices. The cardiac conduction system was uh, identified both by its lighter staining in comparison to the surrounding myocardium and its association with known anatomic landmarks, including leaflets of the aortic and tricuspid valves. On the left side, the human sinus node is outlined in yellow, shown here, in short axis micro CT sections, um, shown here, and then in the matching histologic sections taken here. The plane of the section in CND is shown, um, and on the right side, we see the two ventricles from the view of the atrium, showing the atrioventricular conduction axis, the compact AV node, and the fibrous body uh, alongside each other. Uh, on the left here, we see further re reconstruction work. Um, we see the entire cardiac conduction system, the SA node, AV node bundle, right and left bundles, overlaid on a three-dimensional reconstruction. In figure C and D, we see activation in a simulation as, as it occurs down his Purkinje system and through the ventricles. And uh, we see on the right an example of ventricular activation when it occurs through three points simulated on the right bundle and two on the left bundle. Um, this is from a paper by Dr. Edward Vigmund um, and Gernar Plank and of no, Dr. Vigman was Dr. Boyle's mentor. So let's dive into the sinoatrial node structure. <clears throat> this slide is intended to show the macro and microscopic structure of the sinoatrial node located at the junction of the superior vena cava and the right atrium in the mammalian heart. In the normal adult human heart, the sinoatrial node is 12 to 20 millimeters long and two to six millimeters wide, shaped like a banana. Um, the sinoatrial node in red um, is isolated from the surrounding atrium by bifurcating branches of the coronary arteries, fibrosis, which is shown in purple here on the inside, and it's divided into a head center and tail. Um, 55% of people get this blood supply from the right coronary artery and 45% from the circ. On the right is a histologic specimen 
donation of the Sinuatra node from a deceased human heart uh, at the Ohio State U University Fed Fedarov group. The <clears throat> superior third uh, of the Sinuatra node is typically separated from the epicardium by less than one millimeter of fibrous tissue and fat. Next, on the middle panel, you see that the immunostaining defines the human sinoatrial node borders based on connexin 43 negativity in the sinoatrial node and high connexin 43 expression in the atrial myocardium. On the right, you see a, a Mason's trichome staining used to further characterize the human sinoatrial node as a region of compact fibrosis shown in blue. The sinoatrial node pacemaker cells are insulated from the hyperpolarizing effect of the surrounding myocardium by this fibrosis and thereby efficiently regulate sinus rhythm. You might ask yourself, if the sinoatrial node is surrounded by fibrosis, how does it communicate with the atrium? Gaps in the fibrotic microstructure allow actual potential conduction only through sinoatrial conduction pathways, or SACPs, like those shown here. You can see with blue fibrosis uh, over here is much more present on the left side of the image in the sinoatrial node compared to the right side where atrial tissue predominates. You can see a similar pattern for connexin 43 staining, um, not so present on the source side here and very present on the sink side. Um, and that is just because um, these are called the source and sink because a small number of slowly conducting sinoatrial nodes cells can depolarize very quickly a whole um, atrium afterwards. I want to spend a minute discussing the concept of optical mapping because it's critical to research in electrophysiology. It is difficult to get sinoatrial electrograms because of temporal and spatial resolution for intramural tissue in vivo, which is where optical mapping potentially comes in. The original schematic on the left is from Igor Efimov in 1997, and a more modern setup on the right. The key principle is to see that inaction potential, which is a change in voltage over time, spreads across the myocardium. And a voltage, oops, sorry, a voltage sensitive fluorescent dye changes color as the wave like change in voltage occurs. The signal ends up being an average of the voltage in a layer of myocardium. On the right are the resultant activation maps um, and action potential duration maps. And we'll see a few of those later. So I won't spend too much time on those. I want to show you a recent application of microscopy and optical electrophysiology. Upgraded temporal and spatial resolution have allowed videos of action potentials in vitro. Right atrial tissue is shown. Um, with the sinoatrial node in, in the middle. On the right is a high-speed camera setup. And what I'm gonna show you is a video from one of these high-speed cameras. Oh, there we go. Um, and you can see action potentials actually propagating. This is the SVC, this is the IVC, this is the crystal terminalis, and this is the interatrial septum. Um, what we see is that, although it looks quite organized, if we actually zoom in on one of these areas, um, we can see that there's heterogeneous activity sprouting up in various areas that um, doesn't correspond to the timing of action potentials. And we'll be talking more about those um, shortly. On the left, we have an example of a human sinoatrial node tail to head. Remember on this activation map, we see multiple time points of a wavefront in one figure, starting with deep blue all the way to deep red, 55 milliseconds later. Optical mapping of a human sinoatrial node reveals conduction within the sinoatrial complex traveled from the tail to the leading, uh, which was the leading pacemaker to the lateral border of the sinoatrial node, exiting at the green star up here. White arrows. Uh, indicate the path of conduction. On the right, this histologic section again shows the sinoatrial conduction pathway, same as that green star. The next figure shows an activation map using optical mapping of the sinoatrial node conduction and the resulting atrial activation. You can see they use two color scales, one, uh, both of the same colors, but the first one is for 55 milliseconds and the second one only covers 12 milliseconds. So you can see that the conduction through the sinoatrial node is much slower as opposed to covering this entire area here in just 12 milliseconds comparing to this in 55. Shown on the right is how optical action potential mapping can even allow measurement of the sinoatrial conduction time, a measurement of interest to electrophysiologists. So now that we've seen the tissue level function of the sinoatrial um, node and conduction through the atrium, let's take a deeper look at the cellular and ionic level in which we will see the function of what's called the coupled clock. These two clocks, the membrane clock, up here and the sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium clock down here work together to keep the pace for sinoatrial node cells. I'm going to minimize the cell to the bottom left and focus on the actual potential, the change in voltage over time that occurs as a wavefront propagates. Um, these two clocks are shown um, on top of each other down here with the action potential. 
we're going to zoom in on the cell membrane to see how individual ion channels contribute to this change in voltage because that's going to be key for our discussion later. Uh, first, unlike in the rest of the atrium and ventricle where sodium influx drives phase zero depolarization, it's actually calcium channels that open during phase zero depolarization. Next, during phase two repolarization, rectifier potassium slow and fast channels open and intracellular pot potassium leaves and you can see voltage drops back down on the red curve. Voltage drops to the maximum diastolic potential <clears throat> At which point the funny current is activated. This current is in fact a mixed inward and uh, uh, mixed inward sodium and potassium current activated with slow kinetics on hyperpolarization. This leads to the reactivation of calcium channels uh, that then lead to the depolarization phase again. Uh, the funny current was originally labeled as funny because ionic currents in cardiac cells are usually activated by depolarization rather than hyperpolarization. Um, the next picture shows um, staining in inatrial tissue for HCN4, which stands for hyperpolarization cyclic nucleotide activated protein. This is the protein that provides the funny current, as the H hyperpolarization indicates. As you can see here with the red stain, um, the funny current carrying HCN4 channels are strongly expressed in the sinoatrial node area um, and then not as much in the rest of the atrium. Um, there's still some question as to whether uh, the funny current is the true pacemaking current as some species possess automaticity without it. Um, so that's an active area of investigation. Um, the hyperpolarization, the funny current will be a large focus uh, going forward. But to get to the other part of the couple clock, the calcium clock, um, the last ion current I'm highlighting right here is the sodium potassium e exchanger. It has no specific time dependent gating or clocking mechanisms. And although present in the membrane and affecting membrane voltage, it actually derives its stimulus from the local calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and then leads to further membrane depolarization. Um, confocal microscopy and calcium sensitive fluorescent probes allowed the identification of spontaneous, roughly periodic diastolic calcium releases in the form of sparks from ryanidine receptors on the uh, sarcoplasmic reticular membrane. Those sparks are shown here in multiple ways, as these little bumps on the local calcium release um, diagram here, and as these calcium spikes on optical calcium mapping. These sparks crescendo immediately before the actual potential triggering emptying of the sarcoplasmic reticulum of its calcium. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is then refilled, cycle begins once more. And you'll recall these extra little sparks that I was showing you before probably relate to these calcium sparks um, that we're seeing here, such as that one or other ones shown up here. The main, so let's switch gears uh, to the atrioventricular node. The main function of the AV node is to slow conduction and allow for the atrioventricular mechanical synchrony. The AV node is found in the triangle of coke, demarcated by the tendon of Todaro, the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve, and the coronary sinus shown on the left. On the right are four histologic sections, and what I want you to appreciate is that the atrial myocytes are right in contact with and surrounded by insulating fibrosis in order to help funnel action potential. The compact AV node itself sits in contact with the central fibrosis body. Um, and there are variations to this or organization, of course, much more so than the sinoatrial node. The figure on the left is from Carvalho and Almeida, who in 1960 showed that different areas of the AV node had different electrophysiologic properties. Different regions here are demarcated by letters A through E, as well as their action potentials, which are different from each other. On the right, you can see the work of Inada, who in 2009 showed that you could simulate the slow and fast AV nodal pathways um, by dividing these different action potentials to different uh, numbers of those specific cell types, um, including atrial myocytes, atrial nodal myocytes, nodal cells, as well as nodohis um, cells. The results of such experiments are on the right. On the right is a schematic using green, yellow, and red colors uh, like a traffic light to indicate conduction velocity changes as an action potential approaches the AV node. Green areas are rich in connexin 43 and lead to red areas where conduction slows. Uh, so we've reviewed the normal structure and function of the aspects of the sinoatrial node and the AV node. Next, I want to help you understand the effects of athletic training on these structures. I want to look at several papers from the last years that present novel findings that challenge the long-held vagal hypothesis. So I'm going to need your guys' participation on the next slide. Um, I'm just going to... Um, uh, use the slideshow feature here. Um, and if you don't mind uh, just logging on or uh, responding um, to this link or texting 22333, I'm going to um, just make sure that this is um, running and um, uh, this should be open. If this doesn't work, that's totally okay. Um, but which of the following best explains SA node and AV node dysfunction in elite athletes? Please go ahead and respond to the poll below. <laughs> 
And I realized this may or may not work. I had some issues with it earlier. Well, that's that's okay. We uh, the goal was to hope that um, you all would um, be thinking about the fact that this could be um, the uh, vagal tone, um, and I'm going to try to show you why that may or may not be the case going forward. So sorry for that not working. Um, the the SA the SA node um, uh, has uh, come into more um, accord recently. One group from the UK and several others working with them have challenged the, the vagal nerve hypothesis of exercise and in, in, in induced training effects on bradycardia. I'm going to take you through several of their works. In her paper in 2014, Dr. D'Souza trained mice and rats with aerobic exercise. And as expected, the trained rats had higher VO2 max and lower resting heart rate. She examined the effect of autonomic and vagal tone in mice to answer the vagal question. To eliminate the effect of autonomic input to the heart, she administered propranolol and atropine. In this graph, the heart rate is on the y-axis, and you can see that at baseline, the heart rate was significantly lower in trained mice. With autonomic block, both decreased by similar amounts. Further on the right, we see that there's no significant difference in the heart rate change with changing the autonomic input, arguing against a, vasal effect, a vagal effect. The next thing that the group did was try and figure out what aspect of the couple clock was responsible for this change in period periodicity. On the y-axis in these top row figures, we have expression of HCN isoforms, mRNA, in sedentary trained animals uh, shown here. As you recall, HCN4 was the um, <clears throat> was uh, the responsible for the funny current, uh, the pacemaking current that we discussed. A HCN4 mRNA expression was significantly correlated with VO2 max. <clears throat> shown here, and with heart rate, which differed between sedentary and trained animals. Uh, next, they showed immunofluorescence that stained sinoatrial node tissue for HCN4 protein, uh, shown in red for rats at the top and green for mice at the bottom. Trained sinoatrial nodes from, the sino, uh, from mice and rats had significantly less hyperpolarization uh, CN4 protein. And you can see on the right bars that HCN4 protein by quantity also decreased in trained mice, shown here on the right. D'Souza tested the effect of uh, funny current blockade, since that was related to HCN4. Cesium, a funny current blocker, was given to rats and mice and abolished the differences in training, shown here and shown here. By reducing the heart rate of sedentary animals, uh, which in theory had more response to the funny current and having some, but much less effect on trained animals. Next, they gave evabradine, uh, a funny current blocker to live mice and found similar effects. D'Souza also found differences in several regulators of HCN4 production, um, which are not shown here. Next, D'Souza investigated the effect of detraining. You can see sedentary in black, trained in striped and gray and detrained. Um, for reference, at the top, uh, the heart rate decreased with training and returned to normal levels after detraining. On the y-axis, we have decrease in heart rate due to uh, cesium. The difference um, uh, between trained and sedentary mice disappeared with detraining. Um, the difference in HCN4 actually increased um, and certainly disappeared. And um, we have these other regulators of HCN4 that also showed dramatic changes after detraining. The same pattern existed for TVOX type protein 3 and microRNA1. So in a follow-up paper, D'Souza looked at humans and mice to understand how microRNAs regulate HCN4 expression, opening up our ability to alter these effects with microRNA therapy. She had eight competitive endurance athletes, 10 age match control. She, she utilized autonomic blockade um, and her mice and evabradine as well. And her mice were trained for 60 minutes, twice daily for 28 days and then detrained. On the upper left, you can see the VO2 max. Uh, here we go. On the upper left, we can see the VO2 max of the athletes were significantly greater and the resting heart rate of the athletes was lower, uh, shown in the upper right. With complete autonomic blockade, the heart rate increased for both trained and sedentary subjects. Uh, but because they increased by similar amounts, the trained heart rate, even with autonomic blockade, remained significantly lower. The bottom left figure shows that the intrinsic heart rate has a direct negative relationship with VO2 max. On the bottom right, we see the effect of ev evabradine, meaning how much did it drop somebody's heart rate? The smallest effects were in those who were trained, further implicating a reduction in funny current. The top left figure uh, on the next slide here shows the correlation between HCN4 mRNA expression and microRNA 423-5P, and that generally trained animals had lower HCN4 um, and lower heart rates, um, and uh, that changed their, that was related to their changes in microRNA expression. On the bottom left, we see that microRNA 425p expression was significantly upregulated in the sinoatrial node of trained animals, but no different in other 
uh, atrial and ven ven ventricular tissue, the right atrium, left ventricle, both shown here. Uh, on the right, we see the effects of detraining on microRNA expression, returning levels to no different than sedentary animal levels and significantly reducing them from their peak values in trained animals. Finally, D'Souza showed the effects of the antisense microRNA on the left in sedentary animals, in the middle is trained animals, and on the right is uh, trained animals who received antagonists for that microRNA. You can see HCN4 expression is significantly reduced in trained animals, it was actually greater than sedentary after receiving the antagonist. And you can see shown on the right, they gave cesium to animals to observe the effect of the funny current. And you can see trained animals had less response to cesium while the response to cesium returned to normal in animals treated with the uh, um, antisense microRNA. So in the previous work by D'Souza, we saw the effects on the SA node um, directed at HCN4 remodel. We're going to continue on with Pietro Messerka's work, somebody else from her and Mark Boyett's lab. Uh, in a paper published last year, he utilized horses and included training for three to five days per week. The figures shown uh, show sedentary horses in black, trained horses in red, and uh, um, from the top left down, we can see at the heart rate, the PR interval, and the number of second degree incidents per hour were all significantly um, increased in trained animals. Sorry, the heart rate was decreased. And you can then see on the right uh, with blue dots showing detrained animals that detraining led to increased heart rate and decreased PR interval as a function of time. On the right, we have the effect of autonomic blockade and the PR interval remained elevated in trained animals, even though the overall heart rate did decrease for both trained and sedentary animals. Next, Maserka went to work on why this might be the case. Shown here are AV nodal tissue stained for HCN4 in green on top and in red for CAV 1.2 alt calcium channel on the bottom. And then we have their signal intensities, which just confirm what our eyes are telling us, which is that in trained animal, both of those channels are less expressed. Now, Circa also sought to understand the molecular underpinning of this work. He swam trained mice um, to mirror 10 years of training in humans and found they had AV node dysfunction, including prolonged PR intervals and increased AH intervals on electrophysiologic study that I'm not showing here. He looked at mRNA expression of ion channels and found that the two had significantly different expression in AV node tissue in trained versus sedentary mice, that of HCN4 uh, shown here and that of the um, uh, voltage-gated calcium L-type channel here. And I'm gonna go over those results for a moment. Um, in the case of a uh, um, calcium uh, L-type channel uh, consistent with reduced mRNA levels, um, the signal intensity of trained animals was significantly lower shown on the uh, left side here. Uh, when these cells were studied using single cell um, patch clamp, they found the current density of the L-type calcium channels as well as the current density of the funny current were both reduced um, confirming their observations. Um, and then, uh, as I said, they showed the same thing here with um, HCN4. Um, what they showed next was that um, the effects of giving funny current blocker evabridine, and they were able to abolish the difference in PR intervals between trained and sedentary mice, mainly by making the PR intervals of the trained mice longer with little effect on the um, sedentary, with little effect on the trained mice. The next figure here shows representative action potential tracings, red for trained and black for sedentary, showing a reduction in the frequency of firing of AV nodal myocytes. The slope of both the linear and exponential phases of diastolic depolarization was significantly reduced in trained animal myocytes. There were no discernible differences in the maximum diastolic potential, action potential threshold, amplitude, and duration. Um, the predominant training-induced change to action potential was the slowing of the diastolic depolarization and a longer cycle length, likely explained by voltage-gated calcium and funny current reductions. Uh, here, uh, the next step for Ms. Meserka, D'Souza, Mark Boya was to study the mechanisms that control transcriptional remodeling of the AV node as they did in the SA node, focusing on antisense microRNAs, which were used to knock down um, in vivo swim trained mice using oligosense nucleotides. Uh, black dots show sedentary mice, red dots show trained mice, and blue dots show trained mice given antisense microRNA. On the left, you can see these microRNA levels elevated in trained mice in red here, and then um, com compared to sedentary, and that effect is abolished when they were treated with these antagonists. You can see that in terms of heart rate, um, trained mice have lower heart rates, um, and they actually found that treating with anti-microRNA significantly reduced the heart rates further. Um, but in any case, for the PR interval, um, although it was elevated in trained mice, they found that um, uh, with this treatment, they returned to normal. Uh, I, would, I thought it was helpful to see this representative tracing of electrocardiograms to see the effect of the antisense microRNA treatments with sedentary animals on top, PR prolonged trained animals in the middle, and restored PR intervals in trained mice treated with antisense microRNA. Uh, 
Finally, the group tested the effects of detraining on the previously discussed parameters. Black circles are sedentary animals, red trained, blue detrained. Training and then detraining had a similar effect as training and treatment with microRNAs on the heart rate, PR interval, and HCN4 uh, mRNA expression. Of note, the expression of CAV 1.2 was not restored to baseline, even though other parameters that I mentioned were. So um, finally, we're going to focus here on the structural and electrical considerations that predispose to atrial fibrillation. Um, specifically, we will consider collagen deposition via TNF-alpha pro-inflammatory pathways and increase in left atrial size. Um, we're going to take a look at work by Asher Shobi of the King's College Group in Toronto, who used mice with TNF-alpha disruption, trained them with swimming and running. Uh, these are representative atrial pacing studies showing that on top in the sedentary mice, they were uh, not as um, inducible for AFib as opposed to the swim train and treadmill train mice. I'm going to show you the numerical results next. On the left, the y-axis shows the percent of animals with sustained AF in sedentary versus swim and treadmill groups with a significant number of both trained animals showing sustained atrial arrhythmia compared to sedentary control. Controls. These are picoceria stained micro myocardial cells, which stain red for collagen. Um, sedentary animals on the left, swim exercise animals on the right, left atrial samples on top, and left ventricular samples on the bottom. Uh, visually, this is uh, there is more red collagen deposition in the atrium of um, swim exercise mice, and that is true uh, when you look at the actual tissue collagen percentage. One effect that collagen deposition has is slowing of conduction velocity and promotion of reentry, which perpetuates arrhythmia. What you see on the left is an isochronal activation map um, pacing in a left atrial appendage with the trained model on the right, uh, trained animal on the right. You can see that there are more densely located colors up here on the right, indicating a lower conduction velocity. These are derived from the same optical methods that we reviewed earlier. Shown in the bar graph form on the y-axis, here is the conduction velocity and a significant difference between the sedentary animals on the left and the trained animals on the right. On the top, we have active potential durations, which are also elevated in the swim exercise mice compared to sedentary controls. Next, Asher Shobi sought to examine the causative mechanisms for these findings. On the left, we see the percent animals with sustained atrial fibrillation after training, and in comparison, the next three bars show various forms of TNF disruption, including giving etanercept, a TNF uh, alpha inhibitor, uh, using TNF knockdown mice, and giving P38 inhibitor, uh, which also inhibits downstream TNF alpha. You see no sustained in no sustained AFib in the etanercept treated TNF alpha mice or the P38 treated mice. In addition to college, uh, and you can see on the right here that collagen deposition was significantly decreased in all three of these, especially in the TNF alpha um, knockout mice. In addition to collagen de deposition, left atrial size and G-protein related signaling pathways also are remodeled with exercise. In 2013, Gauch designed a study to examine those factors. He used Wistar rats that were trained for either eight weeks or 16 weeks followed by detraining. Here I'm showing you the percentage of animals that were inducible on electrophysiologic study for non-sustained or sustained AFib on the y-axis with sedentary mice in blue and exercise mice in red. As you can see, there's not much difference at eight weeks, but there is a significant difference at 16 weeks of exercise. Shown on the three plots uh, here in the middle are LA diastolic, LA systolic, and RA dimension from top to bottom, and the fact that exercise training animals had significantly greater atrial chamber sizes at the end of the exercise period. Lastly, the slides on the right show increased collagen deposition in exercise trained left atrium and right atrium, as you can see with more red staining on the right images compared to the left, the percentage fibrosis shown on the right. After just 16 weeks of training, there was a significant increase in fibrosis. The figures shown here are intended to highlight the effect of detraining on AF in inducibility. In the upper left, we see that after detraining for four weeks or in the left eight weeks, um, AF inducibility actually returned to the same levels, despite the fact that the fibrosis and left atrial size did not return to normal in that time period. Uh, not shown is that cholinergic stimulation of potential mediator of altered conduction and arrhythmia remained elevated at 16 weeks. What is shown here is that there's a slight, slightly significant decrease in mRNA expression of acetylcholine sensitive potassium channels in exercise animals. Um, in terms of transcriptional regulation, the authors found significant increase in RGS proteins, especially RGS9. RGS stands for regulators of G protein signaling. The authors sought to test the effect of knocking that down. Um, and what they found was that AF inducibility with carbocol, a cholinergic agonist, um, um, uh, significantly increased AF susceptibility, showing that electrical remodeling may itself play an increase in sensitivity to autonomic inputs, which can be changed. 
Uh, finally, you might be asking yourself, what about in humans? Well, Dr. Kunzman or Dr. Marouche has shown that the endurance athletes do in fact have increased LGE MRI signal for fibrosis. These are left atria on the left from an endurance athlete and on the right atria from a healthy normal control. What is not yet known is what effect detraining has on fibrosis in humans. In summary, we've looked at the effects of exercise training on the ion channels of the AV node and the SA node and the atrial myocardium. Exercise appears to cause sinus bradycardia through down regulation of HCN4, the protein that drives the funny current in the sinoatrial node, and that reverses with microRNA or detraining. Exercise causes heart block through down regulation of the HCN4 funny channel and the voltage gated calcium L type channel. Um, and only the HDN4 effects seem reversible at this time. Finally, exercise causes substrate and trigger changes that predispose to AFib, including increased ACH, acetylcholine gated potassium current, and stretched TNF alpha mediated um, extracellular matrix deposition that contributes to structural remodeling and reentry. These changes are not yet known to be reversible at this time. So we've looked at uh, the athletic training on the sinoatrial node and AV node and atrium. Um, finally, let's examine how these manifest in our patients um, and whether they are veteran athletes or current and ongoing athletes. Uh, first of all, how good is our evidence? I want to ask um, for bradycardia, heart block, and AFib is estimated that one from one population study of consecutive athlete ECGs that 28 to 45 percent of athletes have first degree block, and 15 to 40 percent have second degree, compared to under one percent for both of those in the general population. This figure highlights that just as of a couple of years ago, there was really only one large cohort study of athletes. And let's uh, let's jump into the case con controls first, and we'll come back to that large cohort. In this study from the Barcelona group, they performed a retrospective survey of patients with lone AFib, as in not having the usual association with metabolic disease. The y-axis here shows the proportion of cases with AFib as a function of their total high-intensity exercise in hours. Their top-line result was that at approximately 1,000 hours, there's a peak of protective effect for AFib, and that after that, um, especially about 2,000 hours, the risk was now higher in cases compared to controls. In the next case control study, um, they used cyclists as athletic cases and golfers as controls. They matched golfers specifically with with similar post-career um, cardiovascular exercise as the cyclist. They found that 10% of the cyclists in the follow-up period, um, as well as 3% uh, required pacemakers and 10% developed AFib compared to nobody in the golfer group. One other caveat with the study is that many of the athletes, 71% actually admitted to the use of performing enhancing therapies and uh, those may make these athletes different from some of our patients potentially. Lastly, Northcote published an important case control study and really one of the earliest references on this topic. This table is from the 10-year follow-up study of his 20 veteran endurance runners. They had 19 follow-up, each of which is numbered in the box on the left. They found that after an average of 12 years after competing, two of the 19 required permanent pacemakers, one for symptomatic AFib, the other one for a 15-second pause. Um, uh, two others had signs of advanced heart block, um, and those four are shown in the box on the right. And this is really what we say when we say patients needed pacemakers more frequently. Um, when the study was initially completed, seven athletes had asystolic pauses lasting longer than two seconds, but you can see some of that remodeling reversed because only two had long pauses um, after detraining. The large cohort study I referred to earlier was that by Anderson in European Heart 2013, in which he studied 52,000 Swedish male athletes competing in a 90 kilometer cross country skiing race from 30 years ago. This table from their study shows that with each subsequent completed cross country race, the rate of atrial fibrillation and bradycardia both went up significantly. The relative risk was 2.1 for bradyarrhythmia and 1.29 for atrial fibrillation for those who completed five races as compared to one. Uh, next, we'll show you um, what Lagersh uh, illustrated, um, which was a U-shaped relationship um, across the different studies. Um, uh, data from these three studies showed a reducing prevalence of AFib with increasing low-intensity exercise, but an increasing risk of AFib with moderate and intense exercise. On top, they show the increased chamber size that go along with these adaptations um, that deal with increasing VO2 max. Um, uh, for the last part here, I want to go over the guidelines. Um, let's finish our discussion. Um, this is from the most recent Bethesda conference, as well as from the ACCA AHA guidelines. So how do, how, how do we approach sinus bradycardia, sinus exaflux, sinus pauses, and sinus arrhythmia? First question is always to ask whether they are symptomatic. If they're not symptomatic, then it's okay to continue their athletic act activity. If symptomatic, you would evaluate for structural heart disease, treat with a pacemaker, and restrict their training during your evaluation. 
For AV block, when a first degree block is present, if the patient is asymptomatic and PR is less than 0.3, then they are okay for competitive sports. For second degree type one, you should exercise the patient, and if the improvement, and if you see improvement in AV block, then they're okay for competitive sports. When exercising first or second degree patients, if the AV block worsens or develops type two second degree, then evaluate further with electrophysiologic study and consider a pacemaker. For second degree type two and acquired complete heart block, a pacemaker is often indicated. Specifically, it is a class one recommendation for a wide QRS complex and a 2A recommendation uh, with a narrow QRS complex for type two second degree block. Uh, the 2019 AHA ACC bradycardia guidelines are a great resource on this topic. I'm not gonna go through them in detail here. Um, I do wanna highlight one thing, which is uh, the statement on asymptomatic in in individuals with sinus bradycardia, sinus pauses uh, to not perform it pacemaker in them. Um, I know that they said uh, even in patients with physiologically elevated parasympathetic tone, and I think this wording is interesting in the context of the evidence I showed you today. There are no specific guidelines on AFib in athletes. There's been retrospective work on this topic, um, and some centers suggest ablation due to intolerance of other bradycardia-inducing medications. Um, some suggest a pill-in-pocket strategy um, uh, first when appropriate. Uh, so we've met all three objectives, and with a little bit of time left here, um, I have a few bonus topics that I want to talk about. Um, we took a look at mortality from the paper by Laguerre and from the same paper. I thought this framework was useful in terms of understanding the risk factors for AFib and athletes. Environmental factors like drugs, nutrition, illness, heat, altitude, and not shown, but air pollution, trauma, and stress are important. There's contribution from genetics. Uh, GWAS studies from Patrick Eleanor and Amelia Benjamin have shown HCN4 mutations associated with AFib. There are factors like metabolic health and gender. And finally, there's the contribution of exercise-related factors, including type of sport, intensity, duration, recovery and years and numbers of competition. I would speculate that there is a direct relationship to fibrosis and perhaps therein is where the exercise threshold exists. I'd like to think that we'll find a way to answer this AF question because I calculated the number of hours it, it took me to safely be able to do a 44 pound kettlebell snatch. And it was a lot. Uh, I couldn't even swing a kettlebell when I started a year and a half ago. So with that being said, uh, future therapies may include genetic ab ablation um, to contour ion channel remodeling. The best fits our physiology or designer ion channels. What do I mean by that? From this paper by Messerka in 2016, he shows that on the left, you have a wild type mouse with normal ECG of morphology, followed in the middle by voltage-gated calcium uh, knockout resulting bradycardia and AV block. But then a GERC4 deletion leads to normal rhythm and normal conduction. In a subsequent paper, they show this is possible using GERC4 potassium channel knockout out to eradicate the missing HCN4 funny current effect. Um, I want to ask the question, at least, will performance enhancing drugs of the future be steroids or will they be genetic alterations such as these? Um, shown in the figure are multiple possible genetic targets. In the treatment of AFib, targeting fibrosis through prevention and medical therapy and ablation are areas of active treatment or investigation. For example, from the Hopkins group, they wrote last year on the limited evidence for, or they wrote on limited evidence for colchicine as an anti-inflammatory with the potential to reduce fibrosis in AFib. This is a nice set of the key risk factors for AFib and therefore targets for fibrosis modification. It was missing exercise, you can see here, so I added it, um, but they did discuss that in that reference. Uh, this is the data we presented at Western AF. My work with Dr. Boyle and Akun using our local UW AFib database to hone in on the effects that, of reversible clinical factors like the ones in the last slide have on targeting fibrosis using simulations of atrial arrhythmia and left atrial computational models. Based on the known effects of fibrosis, we've simulated decreasing or increasing reduction velocity in an effort to achieve better agreement between models and clinical outcomes in patients. You can see the different conduction velocities that we tested in the top bar. Uh, ranging from 80% to 120% of normal or of uh, prior simulations. The y-axis of this figure is what we call the model and clinical phenotype agreement. Each pair represents patients with high or low BMI or uh, on, on the left side or high or low atrial LGE on the right side. As you can see, we found that higher LGE and higher BMI are both associated with improved model phenotype agreement, especially at these low conduction velocities compared to the usual. Identifying patients uh, with those risk factors as most likely to benefit from the resource intensive modeling process. I think one helpful piece of data that hopefully we will have in the next several years are longitudinal studies of patients at risk for AFib like athletes, um, including their LG MRI combined with fat imaging as shown here, a topic of particular interest to Dr. Akum and his research fellow, Yakub Jahin, who's currently rotating in our CICU. <laughs> Uh, one particular interesting development that I'm hoping we get to see in, in our lifetimes is biologic pacemakers. Um, uh, however, hopefully you will have seen from today's talk just how complex that proposition could be. 
there are action potential issues in the coupled clock. There is the environment um, created by a balance of fibrosis in the nodal tissue and surrounding tissue. There are the effects of fibrosis and channel alterations to create a source sink balance. And finally, they must be made responsive to autonomic stimuli. These factors are summarized by Camosa in 2021. Um, one other pacemaker type I didn't have a chance to um, incorporate in today's talk is uh, something that is optogenetic. Um, and maybe someone like Pat's graduate student, Alex Oakes, will develop an optogenetic pacemaker. So stay tuned for that. Um, here are my conclusions. Remodeling of the uh, of HCN4 and the funny current in the SA node plays a key role in adaptation to rigorous exercise training, while HCN4 funny current and CAV 1.2 LTEC calcium channel in the AVN plays key roles. AF propensity and triggers are both increased with rigorous exercise training. There's probably a threshold of exercise above which AFib increases, and substrate reversibility is not yet clear. I recommend continuing to follow the guidelines for exercise recommendations. And finally, pharmacotherapy, genetic therapy, simulations, directed fibrosis therapy, and cellular pacemakers are coming. Um, I want to thank Dr. Jordan Prutkin um, for the idea for this um, paper, and then eventually what turned into the grand rounds and for um, all of his teaching over the last few years. Um, I want to thank my uh, mentor, and, uh, my mentor, Dr. Patrick Boyle, and of course, Dr. Nazim Akum for the opportunity to be an EP fellow here, and all of my UW cardiology EP uh, mentors, colleagues, and friends. Uh, thank you so much. On the left um, is a picture from a year and a half ago. You recognize Biscuit, who is this, and then um, uh, Cooper and Beatrice. Um, this is a year and a half later. This was actually just uh, last weekend in Portland. So I'm open to any questions. Uh, those are uh, very cute uh, dogs. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to start with a question. I, I uh, think we, uh, there's one I can already see in the Q&A, but um, that, that was great. That was a very whirlwind uh, tour through uh, this whole field. Um, this question about um, mechanisms of sinus node uh, uh, slowing or dysfunction that you might see, you went through a bunch of them. One of the things you touched on when we talked about atrial fibrillation was fibrosis. Do you think there's a role of fibrosis in any of the sinus bradycardia that you see either in the sinus node itself or in any of the junctions between the sinus node and the atrial tissue? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, and this relates to not necessarily even just athletes, but I think this relates to other populations, especially heart failure, adoption, or heart de disease patients who are at more risk of fi fibrosis. And I've seen evidence of um, uh, fibrotic re remodeling of, of all of these different tissues in those settings. I have not seen that um, for athletes uh, specifically. Um, it seems to be more on the ion channel side, although as you can see, um, when atrial my, uh, myocardium is affected by fib fib fibrosis, that's going to lead to reentrant mechanisms and, and other sinoatrial node dysfunction. So I think that they're interrelated, but um, I did not see any evidence of actual uh, increased fibrosis in athletes in the sinoatrial node and AV node tissue. Uh, this is a question here from Melish Thompson of intense exercise releases troponin. Is demand ischemia the cause for fibrosis? Um, I think that um, there are probably multiple mechanisms um, for the exercise induced fib fibrosis, um, not least of which is stretch, um, which can occur during exercise. Um, I suppose that the, I, the idea of um, microischemia um, is something that could be tested. I'm not sure if high sensitivity trop troponin in exercise has really been looked at and how that relates to that um, atrial fibrosis versus the ventricles, which are going to release most of that um, troponin. Um, I haven't seen um, studies that have really um, honed in on that. Although I think that um, that is one potential driver subse of subsequent inflammation. Um, so whether inflammation directly is targeted or one of the things like stretch uh, or ischemia potentially that leads to inflammation um, are worth looking into. Uh, from an anonymous attendee, uh, excellent presentation. Continuous glucose monitoring is becoming a popular measurement to enhance performance in endurance athletes. I'm curious if there are any data that have shown a correlation in glycemic variability in the triggering of AF in athletes. Um, I think that's a great question. Um, I think more and more of our patients are going to be looking for um, ways that they can monitor 
their homeostasis, whether that's with glycemic control um, or um, heart rate control and things like that. Um, I don't um, know of any data on that topic specifically. Um, I do know that glycemic control um, in general in these patients will um, is helpful um, with regard to AFib, but I, um, I, I don't know of, of any specific um, you know, uh, data on glycemic spikes and, and AFib spikes. Yeah, I'm not aware of anything either for uh, what it's worth, especially because a lot of the AFib events are not necessarily during exercise for, uh, yeah. for these athletes. If for athletes, they're often at, at night um, and in times of increased va vagal tone. Um, uh, uh, but, uh, but yeah, and we didn't necessarily talk about that in this talk, which um, there's a lot more to say about um, you know, the vagal tone that just, um, you could have a whole other talk on autonomic modulation that just didn't necessarily fit um, within the bounds of this talk. Um, so another question for me is, I, I think one of the things with exercise that we don't, a lot of the research, especially in this field has not done a good job with is about dose effect um, mm -hmm. and timing um, of exercise. So, uh, or timing in a lifetime. So what are your thoughts on, are we talking about people who have exercised a lot in their youth and they're continuing to exercise? Does that matter versus someone who is exercising a lot and then stops versus someone who, you know, picks up a kettleball at age 40 and starts being an athlete for the first time? Do you think any of these things matter? Yeah, I do. Um, I think, um, uh, you know, originally I had framed this um, uh, presentation around a case of a rower um, who continued to row and was rowing for 45 minutes a day, 30 years after his um, training and competition in the Olympics. Um, and, uh, you know, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to change this behavior. I'm going to keep, keep doing it. Um, and I think, uh, I, th I think about patients like him um, when, when that question comes up versus, as you said, kind of somebody close to 40 um, who starts uh, kettlebell swinging and things like that. Um, the, the study from um, uh, the cross country skiers showed that the number of competitions um, that people participated in increased their risk. So I think there is an effect to the number of times that one trains their heart to that point, probably having to do with the amount of fibrosis that their atrium accumulates, although I don't know that for sure. Um, that's what I would speculate. And uh, so I think that at this point, we don't have a lot of evidence to do things to reduce fibrosis. So I don't know that it necessarily matters at what point in one's life um, that that training occurs. I think that the SA node and AVA node changes regress um, uh, and you'll, you'll detrain in that regard, but um, it's hard to know that that's actually taking place with the atrium. Um, it would be really nice to have some um, longitudinal imaging studies, um, which are gonna be hard in some of these um, populations, but I think that's really what needs to be done in order to answer that question. Um, I think in some ways it's kind of like the aorta um, and fat streaks and plaques found in really young patients with normal LDLs. Um, and we don't necessarily know what happens to those AORs over time, but we do know that eventually all those patients, um, or many of them, I should say, develop coronary artery disease later in life. So I think it would be really interesting to see what happens to fibrosis in people who throughout, you know, 10 or 20 years before they develop AFib are active or are not active. Um, I think that will become clear in the next few years. And as I mentioned, I think there is a really important re relationship to fat re re remodeling as well because of um, uh, the effects that that can have on cardiac con conduction, which we didn't even necessarily have time to get to here. But in athletes, those are clearly going to be different um, depending on what kind of athlete they are and what kind of training or re regimen they do. So um, I think that we'll, we'll be getting increasingly to a point where we can individualize some of our patients' risk. And I think that's what patients ultimately, um, some of these athletes are going to come to us for specifically. Um, I think for the most part, most of our patients can fall within the usual guidelines of exercise. But I think um, some athletes like this, you can um, counsel them that probably the more they continue to train, the more likely they are to have AFib. Um, hopefully we can, we can treat it um, more aggressively and um, efficiently in the future. Uh, young uh, Kwan had a question of great talk. Uh, so is tachybrady versus just atrial fibrillation, a signature finding of athletes more so than non-athletes, more requiring pacemaker and, a, uh, and AFib in athletes? Yeah, I think that um, 
as as you saw, the the data is actually fairly sparse. Um, we just we we basically have just a few of these case con control studies. So I think, yes, there was a an extra case of tacky Brady syndrome that led to a pacemaker in, in those twenty patients. Um, but beyond that, there isn't a lot of great um, data on that spe specifically. We do know that it is. Um, it is something that we see, but we don't know necessarily the denominator and the sort of full effect of that. Um, I, I will mention that um, uh, sinoatrial exit block is related um, potentially to tachybrady syndrome, um, and that with remodeling and uh, changes to the sinoatrial node, it's more likely to have conduction block um, and more likely to lead to tachybrady syndrome in vitro, um, but um, it's a difficult thing to study um, just because of numbers in athletes and, and um, recall bias and things like that in these studies. Yeah, my uh, anecdotal experience is there, it, it's just sort of this concept of less heart rate reserve, some of these patients. And so I think, mm -hmm. you know, you do see some element of tachybrady and it does make it difficult to change, uh, take care of these patients medically. Um, and so I wouldn't say necessarily a pacemaker is what we offer. I would argue in these patients that an ablation is probably the better option. Yeah, and that's that's, uh, supported by some retrospective work, but not anything um, randomized at this point. Yeah. Uh, Dave uh, Owens had a question of, how do you approach the young athlete with atrial fibrillation? At what point do you rec recommend retraining or, or probably detraining or reducing exercise? That's a really good question. Um, we know that um, AFib is gonna predispose them to risks down the line of heart failure, stroke, secondary outcomes, things like that. Um, even if they're young and don't <clears throat> necessarily um, require anti coagulation per, per se, there's a lot of di disordered homeostasis uh, that results from the AFib. So I think it depends um, on how much they've trained up to that point, um, how often and how bad their AFib is. And uh, kind of to the point, like, can you get away with treating it with um, an AV nodal agent or a, um, a pill and pocket therapy? Um, is it an occasional issue? Or if it's really burdensome and they're not getting out of it, you may want to refer them for ablation even at a young age. Um, and, uh, you know, it would, it, I struggle um, with this in patients. I try to really give patients recommendations that they're actually going to um, live by. And I think that, you know, somebody like this may just need, you know, if they truly want to get rid of their um, ongoing propensity for AFib, um, they may remodel their SA node and AV node back in a way that their um, tachybrady and, and something like that would improve. Um, but as you can see, it might actually take a long time, if ever, for their fibrosis to actually resolve. And if they're already having a high burden of AFib when they're young, um, that is definitely um, concerning that they're going to have that going forward. Um, so hopefully treatment with ablation and probably detraining if they're agreeable or at least a reduction in, in training would be beneficial. I think in those patients, it's also important to consider other factors um, like sleep apnea, alcohol use that might be present um, that you may not necessarily um, uh, think of first just because they you know, are an extremely highly trained athlete. But I think those other mechanisms should always be considered and anything we can do to reduce AFib in those patients should be done that might give them a little bit more of that reserve to um, continue exercising. It's a great question and I'm sure it's a hard discussion even if uh, the young athlete with AFib is rare. Uh, Lyle has a question. Uh, regarding Olympic biathletes who must control breathing and shooting after aggressive cross-country skiing. <clears throat> How do they regulate their heart rates and breathing? Um, in long distance athletes, sorry, I want to make sure. In biathletes, sorry, in like in biathletes, you know, uh, so from cross country skiing going to shooting. And I don't know if you oh, know this answer or not. I don't, do you... I don't know the answer off the top of my head, although my dad was a former Olympic shooter. So, um, but uh, I, I won't phone a friend right now. But um, uh, yeah, I, I don't have a lot of information on that, except to say that, um, you know, they obviously have to, they're trained and can bring their heart rate down quickly. Um, when they are shooting, they have to sort of be able to focus and not have any um, jitters. And the less their heart rate is probably the more they're able to focus in and sort of get their target. But I, I don't have a specific answer for that. Uh, anonymous uh, attendee, is AFib risk different in isotonic versus isometric exercises? 
That's a great question. Um, that gets at this issue that I brought up earlier, that um, the type of exercise um, and the effects this has hasn't really been elucidated yet. Um, for the most part, the study that showed today showed animals that were um, you know, trained with swimming or running. Um, there really haven't been necessarily um, you know, crossfeed athlete or sort of isometric exercise athlete studies. Um, you could look at um, some of the um, EKGs of, of athletes that have found, you know, higher rates of first degree, second degree AV block. And you can presume that, yeah, some of them are cross country runners who maybe are less likely to lift weights, but maybe some of them are football players in that mix um, who are going to be doing a lot of isometric exercises. So I think that even in isometric exercise, you know, um, you might be mixing in less or more um, aerobic exercise, uh, which is going to have the greater effect on your, your heart rate over time. So I think that um, the best response is probably a mix of exercise is best um, at, at this point, but um, we don't have any specific data on, on isometric um, for, versus other types of exercise. We'll hit this last question for you. It's sort of tied into that one from Jay uh, Boyd. Uh, are there certain high intensity sports that lead to a greater risk of AFib or, uh, than others and any physiologic reason as to why? Yeah, um, this actually does relate to the previous question because this, the answer is I feel like anecdotally I've seen more in rowers, um, although there are studies of multiple other um, types of athletes, including swimming and long distance <laughs> running. I think rowing in, in, in particular um, does have that sort of isometric um, uh, requirement um, to really be doing it well and really holding that, that position for that long um, is maybe a little bit different than the other sports. So I do think that there are differences, um, but I think um, there hasn't been necessarily a rower study um, like there have been runners and cross con country skiers, but I think that would be a really interesting um, study to do. And maybe at a place like the UW, we have the rowers to make that happen. Uh, well, it is 8.30, so perfect timing. Uh, that was really great, Freema. I, I learned a lot from that. So thank you so much. And thanks to all of our attendees uh, for coming today and for your great questions. And um, please fill out the evaluation of FEMA when it comes in your email. Thanks thank so you much. Everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jordan.